For more than half a century, Luxembourg has been a center of excellence for international and cross-border financial services. Having flourished alongside European integration and the common European market, Luxembourg today acts as an EU hub and competence center to the world's leading financial institutions. Catering to the needs of global investors, the financial center provides a unique combination of international expertise, a complete toolbox of investment products, and highly specialized financial institutions and service providers. From wealth management, treasury and corporate banking to fund services, banks in Luxembourg have specialized in serving clients across borders. In Europe's leading fund center, asset managers find the perfect ecosystem to launch and distribute funds to investors across the world. Luxembourg's insurance industry has decades of experience in developing solutions to meet the needs of highly mobile citizens and multinational companies. A leading centre for international debt listings, securitisation and post-trade services, Luxembourg is the right place for companies to finance their global activities. English-speaking regulators and administrations, access to a multilingual and highly skilled workforce, a AAA-rated stable economy, an innovation-friendly digital nation, an international business environment right in the heart of the European continent. Luxembourg provides the ideal environment for international banks, asset managers and insurance companies to thrive within the European Union and beyond. Grow Beyond Borders, Luxembourg. Welcome to the Sustainable Finance Forum. Bringing together key sustainable finance experts from across the world to share their views on how finance can shape a sustainable future. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. A warm welcome to this fifth edition of the Sustainable Finance Forum. My name is Judith Bogner, and it's a great pleasure once again to lead you through this two-day digital event on behalf of Luxembourg for Finance. Now, first up, our gratitude goes out to our sponsors and our media partner, the Financial Times, and to our 24 speakers and moderators who set aside their time to share their knowledge on sustainable finance with us. And we thank, of course, all of you who are joining us from around the world, from some 65 countries this year. Uh, we are about 1,000 to 200 participants, so quite a crowd that has come together, even more than last year. As always, everything will be recorded and made available on the website of Luxembourg for Finance after the event. And if you could do us a favor, if you post anything on social media, for example, on Twitter and LinkedIn, please add the hashtag SFFL22 and the handle at LuxFinance so we can all see your comments and share them around. Now, allow me to give you the lay of the land since last year's Sustainable Finance Forum. What we've seen is that since COP26, expectations have truly been rising for stakeholders to walk the talk on their climate commitments. But at the same time, we've seen a confluence of multiple crises that have a knock-on effect on taking action in regards to sustainability and climate commitments. The COVID pandemic, for example, has highlighted social and governance issues over and above the E in ESG. Then the COVID pandemic, beyond the COVID pandemic, the extreme weather events we've seen that have amplified the impact of the COVID pandemic. Just think of the recent flood in Pakistan that has set literally a third of the country underwater. And just now, Hurricane Ian and then the historic drought in Europe. All these events truly bring home the dangers of further climate warning. 
and then Russia's devastating war in Ukraine, which has already, which has strained already, um, disrupted trade and supply chains, and is of course causing food and energy secu insecurity in many parts of the world. And as a result of rising prices and rising inflation, the big central banks in the developed world have responded with the biggest rate hikes since the 1980s. That in turn has strengthened the dollar and caused capital flight from the emerging markets. And on top of that, we see clear signs of an economic downturn. So I find it quite hopeful that against this backdrop, regulators, governments and central banks have been stepping up their efforts to act on climate and sustainability goals. Europe has been leading the global sustainable finance regulatory development agenda by implementing and then fine-tuning the taxonomy and the sustainable finance disclosure regulation. Then over the course of the summer, Germany, leading the G7, has organized decision-making at the G7 level and therefore for the first time the G7 has committed and I quote to predominantly decarbonized electricity supply by 2035 and you can translate that as an end for coal subsidies. At the same time the G7 will get more serious on protecting biodiversity with more public funding and a global framework. And then just recently the ECB has announced its steps to decarbonize its corporate bond holding based on an issuer-specific climate score starting from the 1st of October. So that just kicked off. And I find it also hopeful that despite a challenging market environment that I've just described, there has been a remarkably resilient growth in terms of sustainable investing. Just to give you two numbers to tell us where we are, the Climate Bonds Initiative reported that at the end of June 22, the cumulative volume of GSS plus bonds, so that's green, social, sustainability, sustainability linked and transition bonds, stood at $3.3 trillion. You may remember the slogan, from the billions to the trillions, that seems to be now coming, becoming a reality. And we see that also, if we look at global ESG assets under management, according to Bloomberg Intelligence, the, that number could hit $41 trillion this year, and then $50 trillion by 2025. That would be one third of total projected assets under management in 2025, if the current pace, the pace of recent years, continues. So today we talk about which investment trends have been emerging in the sustainable finance field. We'll talk about the toolbox of instruments that has been ever growing. We'll look at what's next on the EU regulatory agenda. I will also address if global efforts on developing taxonomies in uh, sustainable finance are leading to a convergence or a divergence. And we'll also address the debate about sustainable uh, versus returns, which has been quite a heated debate recently in the markets. And we'll get to wrap this up, the industry perspective. What does it mean to finance the transition in one of those hard to abate sectors, the steel sector? So on that note, it's my very great pleasure to welcome Luxembourg's very own Minister of Finance, Her Excellency Yuriko Bakis, who took over from Pierre Gramenia at the beginning of this year. Minister Bakis, it's great to have you with us at this year's Sustainable Finance Forum. The floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it's a pleasure to join you today for the Luxembourg Sustainable Finance Forum. This is the fifth edition of the forum, but my first as Minister of Finance. Let me also greet uh, Chris Peters, Vice President of the European uh, Investment Bank, who will speak right after me. Luxembourg is, of course, proud to be home to the EIB, one of the largest financiers of climate action in the world. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the world has significantly changed since the first forum in 2018. And all of the changes we have seen since have made sustainable finance even more important. We have gone through a pandemic and a worldwide lockdown that has caused deep recession. Just as the world was on a solid path towards economic recovery, Russia's completely unjustifiable invasion of Ukraine has thrown us into economic turmoil once again. The war has triggered a triple crisis, an energy crisis, a cost of living crisis, and a global food crisis. On top of this, the climate crisis has lost none of its urgency. Central bankers are today faced with the thorny problem of addressing very high inflation rates, primarily driven by high energy costs. Economies are slowing down. Some economists are predicting a recession. Governments, notably in Europe, had to step in to help shield households and companies from exploding energy costs, which in turn is increasing public debt. The Luxembourg government, employer representatives and trade unions recently reached an agreement on a package worth more than 1 billion euros to combat inflation by capping energy prices and also reducing VAT. These are temporary measures to address an unprecedented inflationary environment. As finance minister of a AAA rated country, I maintain a close eye on the 30% debt to GDP limit the government has set itself. A prudent budget policy remains a core priority. At the same time, we need to ensure EU coordination in addressing the current crisis. The EU's dependence on Russian gas has gone down from 40% to 9%, while the storage of gas is already above 80% as an EU average. President Putin's aggression has not only underlined the need to increase the EU's energy independence, but has also reminded all of us that we need to step up efforts to shift away from fossil fuels. I don't need to convince anyone at this forum, I think, that the financial sector plays a central role in global efforts to reach net zero. Indeed, the financial sector is our most powerful tool to help channel investments and to mobilize private capital. The public sector can act as a catalyst here, and Luxembourg has certainly been a pioneer in this field. Together with the EIB, we have a climate finance platform. So far, with 40 million euro investment by Luxembourg into de-risking climate funds, more than 18 billion of project investments have been raised. Currently, my ministry is in the process of launching a new vehicle that will exclusively focus on mobilizing investments to support the green transition in emerging markets. Indeed, the potential impact is highest in these fast-growing economies. Ladies and gentlemen, the global challenge is daunting. 125 trillion US dollars of additional investment is needed to put the world on track for net zero by 2050. The strong focus on E in ESG that we have seen since the COP21 needs to remain a top priority. Climate change is without a doubt the defining crisis of our time. And I'm glad to see that LFF has chosen to go beyond the E for the themes of this conference to also discuss the social dimension, which includes a dedicated session on human rights. To me, green and social are two sides of the same coin. The most vulnerable populations are already today the most exposed to the ravages of climate change. We only need to look at the tragic flooding in Pakistan, for example. As climate disasters and extreme weather events grow in intensity and frequency, eradicating poverty, increasing gender equality, and achieving the other sustainable development goals will be increasingly challenging. But it remains critical to work together towards these goals. The financial sector, again, plays a key role here. We need to scale up impact investments, and blended finance is an innovative tool for doing so. So is an initiative like the International Climate Finance Accelerator, which the Luxembourg government launched with private sector partners. It provides a blueprint for how we can support innovative impact fund managers. We also need to increase transparency on investments. Luxembourg has played a pioneering role in this regard, thanks to initiatives such as LuxFlag and the Luxembourg Green Exchange. Both are today recognized as leaders, well beyond Luxembourg. With regulatory initiatives such as the taxonomy and disclosure obligations under the SFDR, the European Union has already gone further than any other jurisdiction to address this challenge holistically. We are pioneers in this regard. 
but we also need to ensure that there are coherent standards across markets. The financial sector acts globally, and the dialogue between countries and regulators is really key. The disclosure under SFDR concerns sustainability risks in general, not just climate, and explicitly includes human rights. Although the current delegated acts under the taxonomy focus on climate mitigation and adaptation, the taxonomy regulation includes explicit social and human rights safeguards. In March, the EU Platform on Sustainable Finance published its proposal for a dedicated social taxonomy. So the social dimension is rightly gaining more attention in the financial industry. While transparency is part of the solution to help channel investments into the green transition and sustainable companies, one of the biggest hurdles today is data. The financial sector already has the reporting obligations, be it on environmental or social impact of their investments. But what is lacking is access to sustainability data on underlying companies. Regulation can play a role here, notably by contributing to making the rest of the economy as transparent as the financial sector when it comes to sustainability disclosure. The Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive will certainly help. The other lever, however, will be technology and digitalization. Artificial intelligence, machine learning and blockchain can all be powerful tools in aggregating and managing sustainability data. For the financial industry, I therefore see significant potential in better connecting sustainable finance and fintech. Many fintech solutions could be leveraged, so also to address sustainability challenges, from supply chain tracking and microinsurance to climate risk management and tokenized green bonds. While the key themes in sustainable finance have evolved since the first edition of the Sustainable Finance Forum, the urgency of addressing major changes and challenges of our times remains as high as ever. I wish you a very fruitful exchange over the coming two days on market trends, regulatory developments, and importantly, on how we can jointly accelerate the sustainable finance agenda. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Minister Bacchus, for setting the stage for our conversations today and tomorrow. Now, it was 15 years ago already that the European Investment Bank launched its first ever climate awareness bond. This year, the market for green, social and sustainable bonds is worth more than 2.2 trillion euros. And because the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, we know that these bonds are truly worth more because they show the path for true sustainable finance. And to share with us more about the perspective of the EU's climate bank, I have the pleasure to welcome our next guest, our next keynote speaker, Chris Peters, Vice President of the EIB. He holds the Benelux seat in the Management Committee and the Europeans among you may remember him as the former Deputy Prime Minister of Belgium and also the Minister of Employment, Economy and Consumer Affairs between 2014 and 2019. And before that, Chris Peters served as the head of the regional government of Flanders. He's his oversight includes transport financing, financing of security and defense, operations in the Benelux countries and across the ASEAN countries, as well as relations with the European Parliament and with NATO. A warm welcome to you, Chris. It's good to have you with us and over to you. Dear Minister Bacchus, ladies and gentlemen, let me start by thanking Luxembourg for Finance for inviting me today to speak on behalf of the European Investment Bank. Luxembourg has always been at the forefront of sustainable finance and has played an important role when it comes to green bonds and lately also to social sustainability and sustainability linked bonds. 4.3 trillion US dollars per year. I repeat, 4.3 trillion US dollars per year. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the estimated funding gap 
to achieve two sustainable development goals by 2030, according to the latest report from the United, United Nations. Hearing this number, it should uh, come as no surprise to anyone that sustainable finance has become the central topic of discussion within the finance industry and reached center stage in EU and international policy. And considering the escalating climate crisis, disruptions in supply chains, food and energy crisis, just to name a few, I would say, rightly so. Ladies and gentlemen, the time for sustainable finance to push through and deliver is now. Luckily, we have evidence that a lot has been achieved already over the past years. This year, the global uh, insurance volume of bonds with a sustainability focus surpassed the 3 trillion US dollar mark. Europe is the leading market in this field. A recent study by uh, PwC estimates that almost 14 percent of all new European bond issues were in the format in 2021. In 2015, it was true of just 1%, and by 2026, these bonds are expected to represent more than 40% of total issue volumes in Europe. In short, ladies and gentlemen, we are seeing a structural shift in debt capital markets towards this bond segment. I am proud to say that the European Investment Bank, and it was already said, laid the foundations already 15 years ago. Back in 2027, we issued our inaugural climate awareness bond, the world's first green bond. Crucial for, uh, to our initiative was the idea that clarity and reliability with regard to the use of uh, proceeds would facilitate sustainable investment. And I'm glad that today the market, politicians and civil society have all recognized that green bonds with clearly defined use of proceeds and reliable environmental reporting can increase accountability and therefore the effectiveness of green financing. This principle naturally applies to social bonds and therefore sustainability bonds too. Ladies and gentlemen, however, however I see there is also still a lot of uncertainty in the market. Currently, what has uh, remained the principal challenge in sustainable finance is the lack of clarity as to what uh, constitutes green or social. There is no commonly accepted definition for environmental, social and green factors. Sustainable investment strategies can reach from simple exclusions of non-moral activities like gambling, arms, tobacco and alcohol, all the way to sophisticated impact investing. The absence of common, commonly agreed and comparable uh, technical screening criteria is what hampers the future and grow of sustainable investments and what may lead to green and social washing. The G20 highlighted this uh, already back in 2016 in its green finance uh, report. Unfortunately, this also leads to increased skepticism in the market. But although it is not perfect yet, let's not throw the baby away with the bathwater on environmental, social and green factors. The funding gap just mentioned highlights that sustainable investments is, ladies and gentlemen, is needed. Now, when you look to the uh, regulation, legislators are working on making the criteria more specific and more uh, comparable. We expect uncertainty to be reduced as a result, which should support market efficiency, of course. The European Union is uh, at the forefront in the regulation of sustainable financial markets and takes a leading role 
internationally. In 2018, the EU presented its uh, action plan on sustainable finance, you know that, and uh, its core was the idea of a unified EU classification system of sustainable economic activities. What we know now is, and every, everyone is very familiar with that, the EU taxonomy. Despite a strong debate on its role, usability and the level of pragmatism, the EU taxonomy is intended to play a crucial role in harmonizing sustainability definitions across Europe and will help to avoid subjectivity. The key success factor is clearly the uniform use, technical screening criteria along the entire investment chain to be promoted by investor reporting requirements and implemented consistently down the ladder. The EU's proposal of green bond standard intends to turn this into reality. Its key, uh, its key requirement is the alignment of the bond's use of proceeds with the taxonomy criteria. This is what makes the, the, the bond green and which is bound to enable the systematic impact measurement that the capital market can understand and help steer. Ladies and gentlemen, this year, the important notion that sustainable economic activities can be both uh, substantially contributing and doing no significant harm to sustainability has also been introduced, which will help extend this approach to broader areas of the green economy as well as to social activities in due course. It is no coincidence that the bond markets are in the focus of policy makers, as those markets move faster than other product uh, segments and act on expectations rather than in backward looking perspective. They are therefore particularly effective in shedding light on sustainability uh, objectives and their actual implementation on the ground. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that this is very clear and illustrates that sustainable finance and sustainable funding are two sides of the same coin. When you look to the European Investment Bank, we have a very clear strat uh, strategy and this strategy we called the Climate Bank Roadmap. And we are very clear, we intend to increase our green financing to exceed more than half of our annual new lending by 2025. And progressively align our uh, tracking methodology for green financing with the EU taxonomy. And at the same time, we will, ladies and gentlemen, reflect such alignment to capital markets by the progressive extension of the eligibilities of our climate and sustainability awareness bonds and gradually align our climate and sustainability awareness bonds with the proposed EU green bond standards. Our approach is already creating synergies within the bank, which are manifested in the rise of eligible loan disbursements and therefore the increase in the insurance volume of uh, our sustainable bonds. They, these are the fruits of our early and current approach to involving EU legislation on sustainable finance. And last year, ladies and gentlemen, last year the EIB's green financing amounts to a 51% share of annual new loan signatures, which points to promising disbursements and funding volumes in the coming years. Our sustainability funding insurance uh, stands uh, at 13.6 billion so far this year, which is circa 38% of EIB's current total funding volume. We have already surpassed last year's insurance um, record and the uh, the, the forwards are very, very positive. Presently, the EIB is the largest multilateral development bank issuer of green and sustainable bonds with around 64 billion euro in assurance across 22 
countries and currencies. It is because of these results that I would like to argue that the EU's involving regulatory framework in the area of sustainable finance is enabling framework that is bound to put markets in the driving share. Ladies and gentlemen, it is clear. A lot of very important steps have been made. Next, we need to work towards a global convergence. Climate change and many other environmental and social issues these days are global phenomena. The potential of sustainable finance is indeed to foster cooperation and multilateralism on issues that concern us all, which is not a given thing. Numerous taxonomies have been developed in different markets worldwide. What lies ahead of us now is to make these definitions comparable and interoperable in order, to, in order not to risk a fragmentation of markets. A good example is a common ground taxonomy developed by the International Platform on Sustainable Finance driven by the EU and China. Meanwhile, the European Parliament has proposed to include a taxonomy equivalence into the EU green stand, uh, bond standard which is uh, meant to facilitate its application beyond the EU's border. To be seen if or how this proposal may be taken on board. Differences also remain about the double materiality concept. The situation is complicated as it is not always straightforward to separate one from uh, the other. Further guidance and clarity on this topic is needed to avoid misunderstandings and not to have this alignment that is so important. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude. I could keep going for longer, but I'm sure that the people speaking after me will be dig uh, deeper into some of the issues just touched. One thing is for sure. While sustainable finance appears to be a trendy topic with uh, lofty promises, an enormous amount of intellectual and innovating thinking and doing is um, now uh, on the table. Events like this are an important contributor to spur that innovation. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all a very nice day with many fruitful discussions and I thank you, of course, for your attention. Thank you so much, Chris Peters there from the EIB with truly a rallying call that it's time for sustainable finance to push through and deliver. And from the Multilateral Development Bank, we now want to turn it over to the private sector, to the asset management industry. As Chris just mentioned, we've seen that appetite rising for sustainability-linked assets and bonds and other products. The dynamics have, though, also been impacted by a rise in complexity, uh, the search for good data, and also a certain debate about what truly is sustainable investing. Now, to shed some light on these issues and to share with us the latest investment trends in this field, I have the pleasure to welcome our next guest, Jennifer Wu, Global Head of Sustainable Investing at JP Morgan Asset Management since 2019. And before joining JP Morgan, she was in charge of the sustainable investing team over at BlackRock. So she truly brings deep knowledge on the trends in the sustainable investing markets. A warm welcome to you, Jennifer, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Judith. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. Sustainable investing over the last many years has gained significant attention, not only at the policy level, but also in the financial market. In order to create a sustainable future, 
the public sector and the private sector have come to understand the need to work together to address some of the most critical issues as it relates to environmental, social and governance. Regulators have also taken steps to create an ecosystem that allows for more equitable financing. In Europe, we have been leading the charge with forward-looking green policies as well as regulatory reforms. The global market has also evolved a lot to allow for accelerated growth in sustainable finance. But 2022 has not been an easy year with the war in Ukraine, energy crisis, and a rising interest rate in an inflationary environment. The broad market has performed poorly, including sustainable funds, while at the same time, there is a short-term shift back to gas or even coal-fired power generation. So is the green energy agenda now being pushed aside? Are investors still hungry for sustainable investing? These are valid questions. And to answer these questions, let's look at the facts. With the energy crisis, there is now even a greater need for countries in Europe to establish energy independence. And the only way to do that is through sustainable and renewable energy. The prices of solar and wind have dropped significantly over the last many years, such that even for countries that are less impacted by the energy crisis, like the US, are also doubling down on renewable energy investments. And if we look at the market this year in Europe, as an example, more than 100% of the flows have gone into sustainable funds. So that's very encouraging. Sustainable investing is an unstoppable trend that I'm sure many of you would agree with me. Having said that, though, there are a number of headwinds that could potentially dampen the investor's appetite in the years to come. Most notably, there are three. Number one, the upcoming climate conference, COP27, in Egypt, is going to be a critical event for the market to see how governments are doing in delivering against their net zero pledges. Number two, with all the macroeconomic situations that we have been experiencing, climate change is not slowing down. Investors will become even more wary of the limited resilience that we have in face of natural disasters. And number three, the sustainable investing market is actually going through a transformative period whereby there's finally now a greater appreciation and understanding of what ESG is and is not. So let's tackle these things, three things sequentially. First up, where are we with climate mitigation after COP26 in Glasgow? Last year, uh, we had a climate conference in Glasgow and I will argue that it was the most important COP after the one in Paris, where the Paris Agreement was reached. We saw how high emitting countries such as India and China have come forth last year with their net zero plans. Similarly, about 140 countries representing 90% of the global forests pledged to stop deforestation by 2030. And also about 100 countries representing 70% of the global economy pledged to cut methane emissions by 30% by 2030. It was also the first time that different participants in the financial sectors come together with the establishment of the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, Banking Alliance, as well as the Asset Manager Initiatives to come together and commit to provide financing to the transition to a low carbon economy. So why should investors care? To reach the net zero goal, it requires transformative change across all sectors in every country. And what this presents are opportunities and risks. Risks such as stranded asset, i.e. technologies or asset that will no longer be viable in the new economy. Opportunities as in innovative green solutions that can increase a country or a sector's competitiveness. We are talking about changing the way we produce, consume and move about. Therefore, the upcoming COP27 in Egypt is very important. It's the first reality check after all these governments have made their pledges. Investors will need to pay attention to the pace of the implementation of policy to ensure that as they recalibrate their portfolio allocation, they are in line with the pace. There are some good news already. 
We saw how this year, with the Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S., which is the largest ever federal government investment uh, focusing on renewable energy, has actually provided uh, incentives in the market, including tax rebates, as well as uh, tax credits for green innovations solutions in not, for not only just in um, uh, industries, but also for the end consumers. In Europe, despite the short-term volatility and seemingly reversal in the green energy agenda, we actually saw a greater need for countries to move faster on the development of renewable energy. Take Germany alone. Uh, they plan to triple the emissions reduction target by 2030. And we also saw how the price of carbon on the trading on the European emissions trading scheme have now uh, come back more or less to the pre-crisis level and more stabilized. It is true that at the same time, countries such as India and China that we talked about earlier have slowed down on their pace with regards to decarbonization for geopolitical and social reasons. But sustainable investing is about taking a long-term view. There is no doubt that the transition to a low-carbon economy is clearly underway, and that despite the short-term volatility, there is now even greater determinations for country to move to renewable energy in order to establish energy independence and increase their competitiveness through investments in innovative green solutions. Where we are at now is actually not that different from the time when the industrial or digital revolution first started decades ago. However, because of many years of inaction and inertia, scientists are warning us about how close we are to the so-called climate tipping point. And that means the point of no return and foreseeable calamities. Which brings me to the second headwind that investors should pay attention to and start taking action on, and that is climate adaptation. We spend a lot of time talking about climate mitigation. What that means is mitigating climate change by way of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. What is climate adaptation? Adaptation means reducing exposure and vulnerability to climate disasters. Typically, we talk about climate adaptation more in the context of uh, policy needs for far away island countries in the Pacific or some distant way in uh, the following decades. But what happens, what has happened in 2021 and 2022 is starting to change the dialogue. With wildfires in Australia, Siberia, North America, and many parts of Europe, flash floods in major cities in China, Korea, and also unprecedented heat wave and some form of drought across almost every part of the world. Nature is telling us and showing us how, what it's like when we are already at 1.2 degrees warmer than the pre-industrial level. According to the Carbon Briefs attribution map, 71% of the 500 extreme weather events that they have analyzed are found to have been made more likely or more severe by climate change. And of the extreme heat events that they have analyzed, 93% were actually made more severe by climate change. It's also now established that higher latitudes are experiencing a greater than the global mean level of warming than those countries that are closer to the equators. So cities in Belgium and Luxembourg, as an example, are potentially subject to twice the level of heat stress comparing to the rural surroundings. Climate adaptation and the need for investment is needed here and now, not some faraway land or distant future. So where should investors focus on? Well, we should then look at where the risks are the greatest, and they can be categorized into three buckets. Cities and settlements, natural ecosystem, human health and well-being. So on cities and settlements, transportation, critical infrastructure, and real estate all need to be upgraded. We saw how this year in the UK, as an example, airplanes were not able to land or take off at Luton Airport because of melting runways. Investors should really look at their current exposure to assets that are not able to adapt, but also at the same time proactively allocate capital 
to new technologies that can help to create resilience in these critical infrastructure. On natural ecosystem, destruction in oceans, land and forest have a huge impact on our food system. There are also secondary impacts, including tourism and pharmaceutical. And finally, on human health and well-being, labor productivity is probably the most obvious one. Any outside economic activities that require labor, including construction, farming, and even services, will be impacted. Increasing pressure on the public health care system because of heat wave, like what we saw this year in France, can potentially become a catalyst for further growth in the private health care system. So the opportunities to really increase resilience and help us to adapt quicker and better are enormous. The fact is, adaptation is not getting the same level of attention that it really requires. So similar to climate mitigation, adaptation presents risks and opportunities. And it's an area that our team at JP Morgan Asset Management are researching on and one that I will be watching closely in the coming months. Finally, defining ESG. I guess for a lot of people, the questions that everyone is asking today is, is ESG greenwashing? To answer this question, we must start with the fundamentals. There is a tendency for the industry and commentators to use different terms interchangeably, often without context. And that is very dangerous because ESG can mean different things in different contexts. To be clear, ESG at its core is data and information, not something that you can find in financial statements. So the integration of these ESG information or factors into the investment process is intended to help investors to gain a better, deeper understanding of the opportunities that they are assessing and ultimately enabling them to better manage unexpected risks as well as tapping into emerging opportunities. So to be very clear, integrating ESG into investment or ESG investing is about generating better risk adjusted return. Clearly, there has been some misunderstanding in the market on this point. ESG investing is often quoted as the solution to solve for complex global problems like climate change. And when it fails to deliver, it draws criticism and skepticism. What's really important is that ESG investing is not about saving the world. ESG is really about finding well-run companies with a sustainable business model that can outperform on financial term. ESG investing is not philanthropy. It is not impact investing. And these terms should not be conflated. There is definitely a place for investing that goes beyond just generating risk-adjusted return. And it's also on a spectrum, from exclusionary investing to impact investing. And with impact investing, because of its dual objectives, there is a potential for trade-offs between the financial return as well as the uh, sustainable or environmental outcome, which again is not the same as ESG investing. To conclude my presentation today, I would like to leave you with three key takeaways. Firstly, the upcoming, uh, the upcoming climate conference in Egypt is a reality check on how governments are doing with regards to low carbon transition. The pace of policy implementation will have an impact on the risk return profile of our investments. Number two, climate adaptation is an area that investors need to start focusing on now. It's not for the distant future or some faraway land. It's also not just about risks. Technologies and innovative solutions to increase resilience presents enormous investment opportunities. And number three, ESG is not and has never been the silver bullet to solve the global's complex problems. ESG investing is not the same as impact investing. Both are progressing at very fast speed and will ultimately be able to enable investors to generate better risk-adjusted return or contributing to non-financial goals. We need to be very careful with the language we use. So to sum up, I believe that investors are still hungry for sustainable investing. Yes, there are some headwinds, but also tailwinds. Most importantly, 
the desire and determination to create a sustainable future is not going back. Well, thank you for your time today. I'm going to hand it over back to you, Judith. Thank you, Jennifer Wu there from JP Morgan Asset Management. And leading on from Jennifer's insights, you may know that there is a heated debate underway that the efforts to integrate sustainability criteria may be counterproductive for those returns, which relates to the fiduciary responsibility that asset managers have towards their clients. And then some financial institutions have been strained and complaining that their resources are being burdened by rising complexity, piled on by the search for good data, by regulatory innovation, and various voluntary commitments, if you will, which is why recently two pension funds have actually left the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero G funds, which is led by Mark Carney. So our first panel today will try to square that circle and to lead the conversation as a moderator, I have the pleasure to welcome my colleague over at the Financial Times, Kenza Bryan, who writes for the Moro Money section at the FT. Over to you, Kenza. Good to have you with us. Thank you, Judith. The boom in sustainable investing in recent years means investors have been sold an extremely appealing narrative that the contradiction between returns and sustainability has simply vanished. For a while, in the low interest rate environments of 2020 and even 2021, it seems this was a self-fulfilling prophecy that scratched the back of environmentalists, but also fund managers. More money flowed in, higher returns followed, and more stories were written in the mainstream press. Moral Money, the FT newsletter I write for, was set up to ride the wave of excitement this created, but also to examine the trade-offs between returns and sustainability, as well as between different goals on the environmental, social and governance side. And so the question of returns has come back to haunt us all this year. In the US, state attorney generals have mounted a furious backlash against asset managers who make ESG commitments, in particular on oil and gas. In the EU, on the other hand, reforms to flagship green finance rules are raising huge issues of complexity and asking the question of what a green fund is for and how to define it. And everywhere, the tech stocks that beefed up ESG funds and made up huge chunks of them are struggling. So let's explore these regulatory dilemmas and data difficulties with Christopher and Abraham. Christopher, I would love to start with you and to ask you how attractive a proposition sustainable investing is right now from a strict, bog standard returns point of view. So I don't think it's any different than it has been all the time. Um, Sustainability, like all other matters, need to be examined and, and need to be put into a financial bracket, at least if you're in the financial sector. And, and I think that the, um, the findings we have been doing over the last 15 years, over the last 20 years in sustainable finance, are still intact. Uh, we have had some squeeze in, in, in putting in premiums to the market, uh, making some kind of squeeze, which of course need to be adjusted. Of course, the financial proposition need to be fulfilling to future duties. But at the end of the day, the, the sustainable finance market is basically identifying total returns, public and private return combined. And there's a lot of public returns which are ignored in traditional financing. And, and what we're doing, that is that we're actually examining what there's going on behind the scene when we finance projects and taking the whole or the total return into account. And when we see this as a result of that, sustainable finance is often very, very appealing. We can come further into that a little bit later. Thank you. Yes, I'll ask you more about that later, exactly how it is appealing. But let's turn to Abraham. And let's start with a slightly tricky question. Can you tell us a bit about the greenium, what it is, and what it tells us about this dilemma between returns and sustainability? Well, uh, it, we can look at uh, this externality, which is uh, carbon emissions, etc., from a, a positive and a normative way. In a normative way, we know that uh, People who are socially responsible should compromise financial return 
because they get some uh, felicity from holding socially responsible firms, broadly speaking. Hence, no, in a normative way, we can expect a negative alpha for people who are socially responsible. It's quite dogmatic in the literature in the academia. Okay, so people should compromise financial returns to be socially responsible. However, from the positive perspective, the answer is all but that clear cut. That is, when we look at the data, we look at the market outcomes of investing into socially responsible firms and non-responsible firms, we cannot observe a greenium which is systematic, uh, quite high, economically speaking, and uh, permanent and resilient. Which means that we have a theory which tells us you should compromise financial returns. Hence, the answer to the question, can you be responsible and have a higher return? The answer is no. That's what the dog or the theory says. In practice, there is a, a lot of mixed findings, and we don't know if responsible people do incur this cost of being responsible, or because there are other phenomena, which we will we, we'll probably talk about later on, which are offsetting this potential negative alpha for socially responsible investors. And you talked of, you talk from an academic perspective about mixed findings on this issue. Can we go straight into the fixed income market? And can you tell us there whether the debate is more clear cut or not? Well, uh, to be honest, the, the debate is, let's say, cliff cut. There is no greenium. Because when you look at the size of the greenium, which is two basis points, seven basis points, I understand when you have a market which is five, 500,000 uh, billion of dollars, even this little uh, basis point may count a lot. But still, from a statistical perspective, it's probably the, 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 the segment of the market where it, where it is harder to identify uh, the premium and hence uh, the premium for, for uh, social uh, responsibility, which is negative, of course, because the premium compensates uh, holder of irres irresponsible firms uh, relative to responsible firms. But when you look at equities, there, there is a completely mixed evidence. Some people will tell you there is kind of a greenium on the equity market. Others will tell you there is no greenium. And today, we start understanding at least two sources of this mixed evidence. I can develop later on. I just give you the sources. One is the uncertainty about the ESG profile of firms. And the, the second one is the demand shocks to, to responsible firms, which bring about kind of a positive premium toward this, this responsible firms. So you have a positive shock to the demand, which brings about a positive alpha. You have a negative alpha, which comes from responsibility. Together, they offset each other. And this may explain the mixed evidence that we see about the existence of a premium on the equity market. Uh, Christopher, as an industry professional, do you agree with this uh, quite kind of analytical take of the of, of the of the two things that drive this so-called greenium? So, so I, I probably have to be extremely careful with uh, criticizing an academic on on uh, academic perspective, uh, but looking from a practical perspective uh, and and maybe from a slightly different angle. Um, and going back to what you said, Kansa, in the beginning in respect to what is the role of sustainable finance, I think that we, we need to address the, the structural challenges we're having in our society. So over the last 30, 40 years, we've been optimizing our systems by creating silos, so experts in different kind of areas. Uh, we've been making the public uh, responsible and liable for ensuring our infrastructure. Uh, we have specialists in project finance, uh, which is basically doing that, and we have fixed income specialists which are looking into that. When we're looking into sustainable finance, we find a lot of gaps. Uh, so we actually find that a number of the things that can be done is not being done because there's budget constraints. So if you take a municipality, a city, um, they have a certain limitation to how much money they can borrow, how much money they can invest. And they will prioritize that. Maybe they will build schools, maybe they will build hospitals, maybe they will do public transport. They will basically look at what the society is in need of. But things like the water infrastructure, which is below the ground, is not appealing before it's a problem. So in Cape Town a couple of years ago, it suddenly became very appealing. Now, at the same time, as, as there's a number of things that are not being addressed, like the water infrastructure, like housing, like many other things, there's actually enormous returns to be created by creating dedicated financing models. And we're not doing that because of the way we've been structuring ourselves. And that means if if we basically take 10 steps back and look at the way we are financing things and open up for cross-financing or 
cross collaboration. There's a number of things that can be upgraded, sustainable upgrades, improving house efficiency, improving water infrastructure, improving the health system, which is at the same time giving a fantastic return, which is not a giving away alpha, it's not a negative alpha, it's actually a positive alpha. But the positive alpha is coming from combining mandates rather than looking into the same silos that we've been looking at the last 30, 40 years. So I think sustainable finance have a huge role to play in rebuilding our society. And I think it's a positive alpha, a massive positive alpha, but not if you just copy paste what already exists. It sounds like these um, these different silos you're talking about all relate in some way to public infrastructure and to and to and to governments. What do you think, Abraham, about the role of um, blended finance and the role states can play uh, in helping promote promote sustainable investing? So, if you want, so the the, the point I was raising before have to do with uh, the public markets, stocks which are traded, and from there we try to extract some premium. So, and Christopher is more talking about, you know, infrastructure, kind of illiquid assets, real assets, etc. There, we don't have enough data to assess how the greenium is substantial or not. I think as far as time would pass, we will see. But uh, when you look at the traded stocks, and you may expect a spillover effect because, you know, there is a limited amount of money. And if some money goes to the infrastructure and the uh, uh, green uh, uh, real investment, which are illiquid by nature, they come out of the stock market. And we should see a spillover effect, which we don't see. So on the stock market, we cannot observe uh, a systematic clear-cut uh, greenium. Probably on the real market, why not? But th- there is a very simple reasoning to have. If you go for responsibility, you need to forgive something. Okay. So uh, so the, this on this point, academia is unanimous, which is very rare. But it's unanimous on the fact that social responsibility leads to a negative alpha in the medium to the long run. But positive shocks may create some transitory positive alpha, which will also offset this. Christopher, I believe you have some thoughts on this, on this, on this very kind of clear-cut idea that doing good is not good for returns. Uh, yeah, I, I do. And, and again, I'm, I'm, it's a good discussion. And I wish we had a whole evening to sit and discuss this because I, I think that there's a lot of, of things there that can be turned back and forward. Um, the way that we create high returns is with optimizing. It's by fine-tuning models. It's by improving efficiency. Um, and eventually, we have the optimal model for, for, for a lean cash flow. And, and that is creating a, a good NPV, and eventually, we, we, we pay a high price for it. But we also, over the last couple of years, seen the, the danger of just-in-time systems, uh, food infrastructure, grid infrastructure, power infrastructure in Europe. Uh, the pandemic, the health infrastructure. So we've basically been slimlining our health system so that we got stressed. We've been slimlining our food system so we got stressed. We've been slimlining our power system so we got stressed. So these shocks which are coming when you're just in time and when you're slimlined all the time is extremely costly. And and I think that when you're talking about sustainability, you're talking about having a a well-adjusted buffer and a well-adjusted system which is securing the long-term NPV. And, And I... I do believe, and I'm not an academic in this in this degree, but I do believe that there's quite a bit of value in creating that kind of, of safety net and also creating that kind of continuity, which are provided by, by these kind of investments. Now, can that beat or compete uh, the, the optimized model? Absolutely not in the short run. Of course, if you're slimlining a system and running to the last penny, you're going to have a higher return, at least for the next quarter, if, unless something happens. So, so I think this is the this is a part of the debate, the debate that's, that's missing when we're talking about the, the negative alpha and the, 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 the other alphas. But coming back to what I said before, I don't think that the added value in the funds that's going to be created and in the, in the value creation for society is going to be found in replicating what we already have. I think it's about thinking new. It's about creating a, a new perspective in respect to how we're creating our foundation, how we are structurally approaching uh, building societies and start working together, building bridges and work together again to make cross collaborations and cross solutions. I think that's where it creates cross development. What you said at the start of that answer, I thought was particularly interesting about the difference between the short run and the long run. And it sounded like you were making the case for investing with a view on the long run and therefore um, with a focus on the idea of double materiality, that sustainability issues can be good for the investor and good for the planet. 
Do you have any thoughts about um, the current state of regulation, particularly in the EU, um, when it comes to double materiality? I'm not a regulator, uh, and I think uh, I, I think that when you're when you're looking into what the EU is is doing right now, I think there's a uh, there's a lot of applause that needs to be done in respect to all the effort that's been put down to to have one focus, one goal. Also, by defining um, a narrative to to allow um, capital to flow towards towards that goal. So, so I think that there's there's a lot of things which are are making sense. Alongside that, looking from a European perspective, we also, when we're doing that, ensuring our own energy situation, or at least uh, reducing the dependency on on third parties, which is of course energy security issue. So, so I think there's a lot of of, of reason to applaud what's being done. And 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 then I'm not an expert in regulation, so I'm like I'm careful with uh, criticizing actors. I'm going to be careful criticizing the regulators. In that case, um, you talk about the role of third party. I assume you're talking about third party data providers, um, which regulators are incredibly reliant on, and sustainable heads of investment are reliant on. Abraham, what's your take on the so-called data issue when it comes to sustainable investing? And what kind of gaps are there in the data that could be holding back the creation of value through sustainable investing? That's a fantastic question because that's to do with exactly the NPV point of uh, Christopher. In the NPV, in fact, you have two components. You have the cash flow and you have the discount rate. So probably uh, when you go green in the medium to the long term, you are going to create new uh, uh, pool of uh, customers and generate better cash flow in the future. But uh, the question is, what's the perceived risk of this cash flow? So if the discount rate offsets the augmented cash flow, the NPV can be zero and even turn to be negative, okay? In the medium to long, it's, it, it's a big challenge how to discount. It has to do with your question because data vendors, I would like to make two comments on your question. One is about data vendors. What we know, uh, we know that... Uh, uh, the disagreement among data vendors create a kind of uncertainty around the ESG profiles of firms. And because they are creating a kind of new source of risk, automatically they are creating a new source of risk premium. This will increase the discount rate, and this may harm the net present value. That's one point. So we know that there is disagreement among data vendors, which may harm the possibility of creating a value. The second question and by data vendors, just to clarify, I think we're talking here about some of the big ESG data providers like MSCI, like Sustainalytics. And the problem we face there is when you when you dive into their methodology, there isn't that much that's publicly available about how they build their ratings. So no, sorry. No, you do have you do have granular data on them. That's quite uh, I have been working a lot, a lot, a lot with MSCI, Refinitiv uh, and others. And you, do, you fairly have enough data to assess the quality of the data. But the point is the following one. We are judging morality and values. By construction, there are seven, I don't know, seven billion people in the world. Each one has its own referential. So impossible to have one rating which fits all. So I'm not sure that having a taxonomy is the best way to go. To the contrary, if we have 10 raters and the company is first with the 10 raters, you should be super confident that this company is satisfying a lot of systems of values. But if the company is not well ranked over all the data renters, then you have a huge uncertainty about the morality of the company. So I'm not sure harmonizing. I know that some academics are too dogmatic. They want one data set, and they say that if the, all the data say the same thing, like in the fixed income market, when you go to shopping for rating, the correlation about the rating among the three, four big players is 0, 0.99, .9, which means that fixed income rating is completely useless because they say exactly the same thing. But if we have raters who say different things, I think it's informative. And you see that we are stressed, but the professional world lives very well. And you see that people, retail investors, which usually we, we name, uh, we not with good names, but retail investors do trust the capability of asset manager to use this data and to make a clever investment, sustainable investment. Abraham, that was such a passionate case for, for the need for, for multiple ESG data providers in the market. I love it. Um, because, yes, it's true, you often hear more about, uh, about fears that they're providing different kinds of data that it's impossible to read. Maybe not for you, but, 
but but that, that that's what you hear a lot of people say and it's why regulators have introduced at least in the EU this idea of regulating the provision of ESG data but it sounds like that from your perspective that's absolutely not the answer I wonder Christopher what you made of that and if you could bring in uh, possibly even as our final question um the role education can play uh, in in uh, increasing our capacity to invest sustainably yeah so 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 I want to on the first hand, I want to just to make a short comment on the on the data providers. Um, I think that the the financial sector, as such, uh, will always be extremely reluctant to take ownership of defining what is right and what is wrong. We 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 want to be right on finance. We want to advise on finance. But when it's coming into building societies, doing right on the social side or doing right on the green side, we need help. We need definitions, right? And and and. Um, I think it's very, very few financial institutions that are willing to 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 risk their their recognition and their their platform by having a viewing. Hence, uh, having these kind of of uh, third party verification and also aggregation of data, allowing to build benchmarks and and references, are going to be essential for mobilizing the financial system. And then one can discuss on the quality and the added value and so, uh, which is which is then a different diff, different matter. Uh, the second question, Ken, so what was that? It was just a few final words on the role education can play role in all these could, questions yeah. we've been addressing, yeah. because so, I think that's so we, something you've worked on personally. Yeah, no, so we, we, we have been very, very engaged. So we, we actually had a, a, we created a private-public partnership with the German... And when you say we, remind us who, who you're talking Sorry. about. Sorry, so uh, SEB, the bank I'm working for, um, created a private-public partnership with a German aid uh, GI set, which is like 20,000 people working on... on, on uh, technical system to uh, educate or to work together with regulators in China, India, Brazil, and Mexico to create the green financing markets back in, in 2016, 17. We worked for that for, for, for more than three years, had 72 workshops, um, more than four and a half thousand employee, uh, participants um, and translated the learnings into uh, e-learning together with the UN, UN Learn, uh, UNITA, uh, which is now running out there and being taken by more than 30,000 people. And, and I think that that education, both internally in our organization, but also externally with, with other participants, is essential because, as I said, it's, it's very, very few financial participants that's willing to, to risk their rep reputation by, by uh, making a job on the green. And that means to have some kind of a basic platform learning about this is giving comfort to take the next step and next, next step. And that, that, that is basically uh, what we think is required for, for growing the market. So a lot Thank of Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm going to head straight back to Judith and hope that this whole talk has served as one of those education tools and debate tools uh, that we've been talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kenza Bryan and her panel speakers, Abraham Liui and Christopher Flensburg, for this tour de force on sustainability versus returns. And indeed, they've already given us the cue for our next guest speaker. The EU has been, of course, leading the efforts in building a sustainable finance regulatory architecture that underpins its Green Deal and helps to channel capital into sustainable economic activities. That kicked off back in 2018 with the Sustainable Finance Action Plan, which was then updated last year in July with the so-called Strategy for Finance the transition to a sustainable economy. Our next speaker, Claude Marx, will share with us where the strategy is at and what's next on the regulatory agenda. As Director General of the Luxembourg Financial Supervisory Authority for Bank CSSF and as member of the Board of Supervisors of the European Securities and Markets Authority, ESMA, he's of course right in the middle of this regulatory evolution, if you will, and know also quite a bit about the complexity some financial players have been complaining about. But can also advocate why it matters for the financial sector to deliver on sustainable finance, as Chris Peters put it so aptly earlier. So warm welcome to you, Claude, and over to you.
Well, thank you, Judith, and uh, uh, thank you also for having me at this year's uh, Sustainable Finance Forum here in Luxembourg. It's an honor to address uh, you all. Um, in July um, this year, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution. Uh, it was a landmark resolution, actually uh, recognizing the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment as a human right. And we are part of the stakeholders, you know, the United Nations has called upon to create this environment. And the significant position that Luxembourg holds uh, as a leading finance center gives it a key role and also a key responsibility in this area and uh, as, as, as you all know, uh, Luxembourg is a home to many banks. It's also a home to investment funds, to insurance, to reinsurance companies. So we clearly have a key role uh, to play here. The EU action plan that you referred to uh, on sustainable finance was designed actually to mobilize private finance uh, and uh, 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 with this uh, private finance, in addition to public funding, uh, to fund the sustainable economic growth in Europe, while at the same time managing the risks stemming from environmental, social and governance issues. And the whole thing, uh, as a reminder, is part of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable uh, Development. And without private finance, none of this can happen because public finance will not be able to finance this transition. The redistribution of financial assets to sustainable investment opportunities represents an opportunity for Luxembourg um, to distinctively contribute to this private financing bit. The CSSF as a regulator um, has definitely a key role to play here. Um, it was mentioned several times, uh, regulators, national competent authorities, ESMA. Um, we, we have a key role to play here to guide, to accompany and to accelerate this transformation uh, whilst preserving financial stability and also whilst making sure that our finance centers remain, of course, competitive. So this is uh, to accompany the sector in a, in a proactive way. And we do that essentially by uh, taking a risk-based supervision approach, by awareness raising and also by educating. Now, some of the legislative work you refer to um, is already in place, but there is more to come. Uh, it really started, as you say, in the revised plan in, 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 in 2020. First bits implemented in 21. Um, a lot implemented this year, actually, and then there is more to come. So I'm going to uh, start by talking a little bit where we stand and then to uh, look forward what is still uh, coming. So where do we stand? I think ESG factors have been on the forefront of the regulatory agenda. Uh, across all sectors. Um, the, the transformation is underway, as I said, um, but uh, in 2022 was a particular busy year uh, and the, the founding building blocks actually were really put in place of this transformation agenda. I can see three of those big building blocks. The first one is fostering transparency and keeping uh, up building the uh, EU taxonomy that has been talked about a lot. The second building block is strengthening sustainability disclosure and accounting rulemaking. And the third one is incorporating sustainability in financial advice. Let me briefly touch upon these three topics. On transparency and on the taxonomy, the process of establishing detailed criteria on how to classify activities as sustainable has been ongoing throughout the year. And you have certainly followed those long, painful discussions on nuclear and gas. And finally, it has been decided that those should be included 
after long discussions in the EU taxonomy with a view of helping the energy transition. And with what is going on in Ukraine, I think this is now very topical also and the energy shortage and crisis uh, we will be facing now. Uh, in parallel, the regulatory technical standards uh, to uh, the disclosure of pre-contractual information under the SFDR uh, have been adopted and will be applicable as from the 1st of January 23. And this is a key uh, milestone in this whole agenda. An updated version, by the way, of the technical standards incorporating nuclear and gas uh, is underway. The CSSF has continued to raise awareness to the market of the upcoming regulatory deadlines and have active, has actively engaged with market participants uh, here to guide them. Um, the CSF, as far as investment funds are concerned, has made available actually a specific examination and visa processing uh, to practitioners for updating the pre-contractual documents on sustainability related disclosures and those are available for the rest of this month so until the end of October. On strengthening sustainability disclosures and accounting rulemaking it is all about obtaining quality data and this has been mentioned by previous speakers already this is really a key uh, feature here. Um, as of January 22 financial institutions and non-financial companies that are already within the scope of the non-financial reporting directive um, have been required to report on eligible activities for the first two requirements, climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. The CSSF has regularly communicated uh, on this to the market and has also explained the phased in approach that we have here. Um, we are about to have the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. Uh, there was a political consensus already, uh, so it's, a, uh, it's, it's expected to be uh, adopted shortly, the CSRD. And this will introduce more detailed sustainability reporting requirements. It will also extend the scope uh, to cover all areas uh, concerned by the Green Deal and uh, there will be a phased implementation here uh, starting in 2024 for companies that are already within scope of the old directive and then 2025 and 2026 for others. This will allow financial markets to build a database of comprehensible and reliable sustainable uh, information. And then on incorporating sustainability in financial advice, I think here uh, bankers and financial advisors have a key role. Um, as you know, since the 2nd of August this year, investment uh, advisors and discretionary portfolio managers has, have to obtain specific information on clients' preparedness and preferences regarding sustainable investments, uh, to, and they have to meet such preferences in their portfolio management. And this comes in addition to other investment objectives and of course taking into account financial uh, surface and also uh, knowledge and experience of customers that are the classical MIFID obligations. Um, ESMA uh, has recently released final guidelines on MIFID II sustainability uh, requirements um, to integrate sustainability preferences. Um, I should mention that recently the CSSF together with the Luxembourg Sustainable Finance Initiative and also the Bankers Association has done a survey uh, on what people know about sustainable finance and products and uh, there's no surprise you know there was a half of the people admitted that they have no clue of what exactly these words mean. Uh, to them, let alone uh, understanding Article 8, Article 9 and so on. Um, but also what is interesting in this survey is that 61% of the surveyed people said that they trust their banker um, for, uh, uh, to get good reference information and also they trust 
uh, their banker in, in general. And so you can see the key role here that the banker, the financial advisor, will have to play. Um, in the panel just now, uh, uh, it was mentioned that financial education is a key priority, and it is. Because if people are not educated, uh, of course, to a minimum, um, then there is a risk uh, that this effort will fail and the money will not be directed as it should uh, into the area here. Now, what are some key upcoming dates? Uh, we have the MIFID II sustainability factors that will be integrated into MIFID II product governance obligations on the 22nd of November. And on the 30th of December, principal adverse impact disclosure requirements at product level under Article 7 of SFDR will apply. So that's for the two months or three months to go. Uh, then for 23, we have uh, a few key milestones. We have, as I already mentioned, the regulatory technical standards uh, of SFDR that will enter into force. This is huge. It's 13 technical standards grouped in one delegated act. We also have um, non-financial undertakings that will have to start reporting uh, their taxonomy alignment uh, for financial institutions, this will only happen in 24, so that they will have actually the data from the non-financial undertakings they have in their portfolios and, in their, and on their books. And then mid next year, on June 30th, um, for entities that do consider principal adverse impact, the publication of the PAI statement will be expected at financial market participant uh, level. And the reference period here is going to be 1st of January 22 to 31st December 30, uh, uh, 22. Now, and then finally, the amended ASMA guidelines on MIFI II suitability requirements will enter into force six months after its publication. Now, what more do we have to expect on this agenda? Um, you know, this affects, as, as, you, as you already mentioned uh, previously, um, the way business is conducted, the way products are designed uh, and data gathering. And so the agenda is far from over. I think there are three hot topics that um, are work in progress and where we will see over the coming months and, and, and years new developments, further developments. First is greenwashing. Greenwashing is a central theme in the whole uh, area here. And the development of the regulatory framework, of course, has triggered uh, an increased demand of products that are uh, green uh, and that have sustainability features. Now, clearly defining and better understanding uh, the phenomenon of greenwashing is very important here uh, because it is all about trust that people eventually will have in the products. So the European Commission has mandated the three European supervisory authorities to come forward with a common high-level understanding of the key features of greenwashing and to prepare a progress report and then a final report on various aspects of greenwashing. In this context, uh, stakeholders' contributions uh, will, of course, be called upon. So greenwashing is clearly uh, a big topic. Second, ESG ratings, and this has also been touched upon in, in the panel uh, just before my talk. Um, the use of reliable data sources and transparency here are of utmost importance. The EU Commission has published a summary report in August this year on its targeted consultation on the functioning of the ESG ratings market in the European Union and on the consideration of ESG factors in credit ratings. There will be an impact assessment uh, still this year or beginning of next year, and then in Q1 next year, the Commission will propose either legislative or non-legislative initiatives uh, in this respect. And third, integrating climate risk in internal governance is key. I won't expand on this, but uh, the ECB has highlighted that European banks struggle to integrate climate risk fully 
into their uh, models. And uh, the ECB has actually urged banks to fully integrate all climate risks into their risk management at the latest by 2024. And the ECB obviously also had in mind here um, physical risks. Now, when I look to Luxembourg, I don't see uh, that many physical risks, um, but I see other vulnerabilities that need to be taken into account. I see two. Uh, first, there is a quite a high exposure on the lending side uh, to carbon intensive sectors. If I look at the end of last year, the aggregated loan book um, was about 70% uh, to carbon intensive sectors at the end of last year. And that is, of course, a risk. The second risk is the loss of value and uh, also the decreasing custody fees uh, on brown assets. And that is something that Luxembourg banks that are very active in uh, portfolio management in private banking will need to be carefully consider. And then, of course, you have the operational risk, the reputation risk, all that we uh, call uh, conduct uh, risk. So credit institutions should continue to integrate climate risks and environmental risks in their traditional uh, risk categories and should take them into account in business strategies, in governance and in risk management frameworks. Actually, the CSSF had published uh, a circular letter in 21 on this topic and highlighted the importance of governance in this area, also starting with the tone from the top. You know, uh, the board, the C-suite really needs to take this as a priority and fully integrate in the business strategies and the risk assessments. So how do we prepare for all these challenges ahead? I think, as I said, the CSSF has this top on its agenda. And, uh, you know, it, it will go into the fundamental missions of the CSSF, consumer protection, investor protection, whilst safeguarding financial stability. We are aware this cannot happen overnight. But what is important is that people prepare in a timely way, because otherwise they have no chance to uh, do this. Three points will be important. Building expertise, upskilling, reskilling, training is key. Developing adequate tools to gather reliable data and thirdly, educating the market on supervisory expectations and holding stakeholders accountable. And I think this is a joint effort that we as national competent authorities do together with ESMA uh, and EBA um, in our areas and then IOPA of course as well. I think because climate change is reshaping our way of life only a shared and collective response uh, can succeed in combating its effects. And the CSF is certainly ready to play its role there uh, to develop a more sustainable finance system. Thank you very much, Claude Marx there, head of the Supervisory Authority for the financial sector in Luxembourg, which, which quite a detailed list of what's coming down the pipeline as far as regulation is concerned. And uh, just to pick up on some of what uh, Claude has said, so the sustainable finance regulatory, I always call it an architecture because it has many pieces that are still being built and fine-tuned, built by the EU has been indeed emulated by some other regions and countries around the world, though various regions have their own ambitions and have started to build their own frameworks. Now, the Future for Sustainable Data Alliance actually calls it taxomania, which um, has, of course, a serious undertone because we are all dealing with a global problem and the integration of, of climate uh, commitments. But there are at this time some 28 different taxonomies out there. Meanwhile, there are also efforts at global level, say at G20 level, uh, Chris Peters mentioned it earlier, to work towards a common understanding. Will there ever be one taxonomy to rule them all? Or will finance have to content with some sort of divergence? And what are the fault lines for a potential convergence? All these questions will be addressed by our next panel, and this panel is moderated by the, the Financial Times' Simon Mundy, who is the editor of DET's the newsletter Moral Money.
Welcome to you, Simon, and to your panelists. Over to you. Thanks, Judith, and hello, everybody, and welcome back. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today moderating this session. Um, as Judith mentioned, I'm the Moral Money Editor at the FT. Moral Money is our newsletter that goes out three times weekly on sustainable finance and business issues all over the world. And over the past year or so that I've been doing that job, I've become a real geek when it comes to sustainable finance standards. And this is an area that a lot of people find very heavy and esoteric. But the reason I've become a big geek about it is because it really matters. There's a lot of movement in this space at the moment. There's a lot of need for more movement in the space. And there's a lot of concern about the coordination of the movements that are happening in different parts of the world. Concerns about possible fragmentation, concerns that companies will have to deal with a bewildering range of different competing standards that are not properly coordinated, and that that could potentially hold back progress more broadly towards the goals that we really need to achieve. So I'm pleased to be joined by three really great panelists on this session. Uh, Ria Asakura is the Deputy Director for the International Affairs and Risk Analysis Division at the Japan Financial Services Agency. Victor Van Horn uh, started just this year um, following an illustrious prior career um, as the Managing Director and Head of Brussels Office for ICI Global. Um, and Petter Wagner is the Deputy Head of the International Affairs Unit at the European Commission. Um, so, Victor, I thought we might start with you for a sort of global overview. Of course, your members are investment funds from all over the world. This issue that I alluded to just now about the, the threat of fragmentation, the, the concerns that some in the investment industry and elsewhere have about this, this, this confusing mixture of different standards in different places, do you and your members have such concerns? Uh, I think you may be muted there, Victor. Thank, thank you, Simon, you for uh, the question, and uh, thank you very much for Luxembourg uh, Finance Initiative to invite me today uh, on the panel. Um, I think it's a great question. I think we've heard from previous panelists in discussions at this morning's event uh, that we are seeing a lot of activity across jurisdictions. Uh, as Judith just mentioned, we're seeing 28 taxonomies worldwide. Uh, so the signals are there that there is a you know, there's a lot of good efforts. We're all trying to achieve the overall objective uh, that, that is set in the uh, climate, Paris Climate Agreement of 2015. But I think behind all that activity, we are keeping a watchful eye to ensure that this doesn't result in fragmentation that may or may not entirely be necessary in, in some cases. And I think there's two uh, points I'd like to highlight. One thing is in the context of COP26, we have seen great excitement about the world coming together as part of the International Sustainability Standards Board Initiative, the ISSB. I think we've managed to build a global consensus about the need for a global baseline on climate reporting. Um, I think it's fair to say that this, you know, keeping this global consensus is important and it requires us to, to, to look always for compromise. At the same time, I think we've seen the European Union, which has been a really a thought leader in the space, move ahead uh, and move ahead with its corporate sustainability reporting directive, which mandates a, a, you know, the body EFRAG to develop a whole range of sustainability reporting standards. And I guess our, we, we need to make sure that whatever the kind of EU adopts, recognizing it may have a different focus and i think we don't you know we, we don't dispute that but it need we need to make sure that this works with the global baseline that other jurisdictions will build upon in their own frameworks and the reason is if we think back to where we started the idea of all these efforts was that investors need comparable and verifiable data to make the right investment decisions and comparable is essential so i think on that point making sure that we have the right coordination and that at the end of the day, you know, things like 
metrics, data points that are uh, mandated are calculated the same way, that we're talking the same language will be vital. And so the second point is also that we have seen, you know, again, I think the EU's taking the lead here with its sustainable finance disclosure regulation, which the previous intervention explained, you know, explained heavily all the uh, milestones we still have to make this operational with all Q and A's, technical standards. So I won't go into that. But we're now seeing also a number of jurisdictions worldwide adopting similar rules around, you know, disclosure for and transparency for ESG investment products. And I think here we just need to make sure that all those different frameworks are compatible, that they work together. And and what we wouldn't, what would be unfortunate is if at the end of the day, we get ESG or sustainable products in one jurisdiction that that cannot be considered as such in another jurisdiction, because ultimately fragmentation leads to extra costs. Investors will, at the end of the day, somewhere have to bear the additional cost because we will have different investment pools to cater to different regions. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks so much, Victor. A really good overview there. Um, Petra, I want to get in to more detail a bit later on with exactly um, your, the work that you and your colleagues <coughs> are doing um, within the European Union. Um, but just to uh, follow up on what Victor said there, um, you know, he raised the prospect of, you know, you may have investment products or other assets that are considered sustainable in one part of the world, in one major market, not considered sustainable in another. Um, how widespread do you think that problem could be? Do you think people are right to be concerned about that? Or do you think it's been a bit overblown? Well, hello, everybody. Um, um, what, what I think is that the um, issue of fragmentation, potential fragmentation or risk of fragmentation is probably as old as, uh, you know, um, global regulation of financial services. Uh, we had uh, to look at the, these risks already after the financial crisis. And I think by now we've, we've managed to overcome many of these uh, risks. And I would want to put a positive spin on that, that um, we will obviously all want to work for the same goal and towards interoperability. Now, of course, the devil will always be in the detail. I don't think that I think we need to be um, cognizant of the fact that it's very unlikely that the, uh, all the jurisdiction in the world will produce the exact same legislation already for reasons of how legislation is being done. Uh, um, but at the same time, uh, I would like to point out that the international engagement, and that's the area in which I work, is quite, is quite strong, starting from G7 to G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group, uh, through the international platform uh, on sustainable finance, where people really try to look at each other's what they're doing, and then try to go in the same same direction. Also, what I would point out that the risk of fragmentation. I understand the, um, the private business worry about the risk of fra fra fragmentation. I would like to also point out that we are all at the creation phase, or what I call a creation phase. It's very nice that the European Union is leading, as we've heard on the previous panels, and we like to hear that. But we are also still actually, you know, drafting or, or going to implement. This. So, while financial regulation will never be static, um, I. Think think that many of these things will be arranged and settled when people will be inspired uh, from, from one or the other jurisdiction has done or has not done. So, um, but indeed, uh, one rule for the world, uh, I would find it unlikely. Yeah, that's well put. Thank you, Peter. Um, Ria, coming to you, I think um, that there has been this sense, perhaps, that a lot of this is being driven um, within the EU. Um, but of course, the, the single biggest mass of the world's population is in, is in the Asian region, and there's a lot happening in Asia, and not least in Japan. Um, so could you talk us through um, some of the, the important developments that have been happening in Japan and more broadly in the region? Thank you, Simon. Thank you so much for introduction. So I agree with uh, Petro and Victor. The regulators are entering the implementation phase after spending time for research and development. As a result, concerns over market fragmentations are growing now. So discrepancies of national or regional regulations have 
put uncertainty or excessive burdens on financial institutions and increase the risk of the regulatory arbitrage. Uh, so therefore, regulators are taking actions, uh, as both of you mentioned, at an international level to avoid market fragmentation, as well as ensure a level playing field. Uh, there are uh, various initiatives for further strengthening con uh, coordination between supervisors. The Japan FSA is a part of that. And so it's not about Japan, but it is a positive uh, news for the co cooperative initiatives that the US federal uh, government is accelerating their efforts to tackle the climate risks. So yesterday, they just announced the establishment of the Climate Related Financial Risk Advisory Committee. Uh, they also announced last week that uh, they are conducting a climate scenario analysis. So, uh, so, however, I don't think the US and the EU approach will be perfectly aligned. Uh, there are still challenges remaining. So, uh, as Petro mentioned, so we are still in embryon, em, uh, embryonic uh, stage. So, we are improving, improving scenarios such as increasing uh, granularity and incorporating spill of effect. Uh, for this sake, we need to uh, collect best practices and apply trial, trial and error approach. So uh, as for uh, Japan uh, practices, so we share uh, ultimate objectives towards tackling climate-related risks with the EU and the EU US. Uh, we collaborate in some areas while uh, taking different approaches in others. So for example, the EU is requiring corporates to report green taxonomies-based metrics such as green asset ratio, uh, and uh, the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group is working on developing sustainability-related disclosure standards, uh, as already uh, introduced. So, however, ISSP is going to provide a global baseline of sustainability-related disclosure standards, and its proposal do not contain any taxonomy-related metrics. So, an increasing number of jurisdictions are uh, exploring taxonomies, but many of them are taking a voluntary approach instead of introducing taxonomy regulations. So, Japan is establishing the framework of transition finance instead of in introducing green taxonomies. So, also the Japan FSA applies uh, dynamic materiality instead of double materiality that the EU supports. The concept of dynamic materiality argues that materiality should be considered dynamically. Any sustainability topics can become financially material over time in response to regulatory changes. Uh, so uh, maybe stakeholders' views as well. So therefore, the single materiality approach does not mean uh, necessarily mean uh, to neglect uh, inside-out impacts. So on the other hand, we share the importance of the transition finance within the EU. So, for example, the Japan FSA is a member of IPSF and uh, co-leads a working group on transition finance with Switzerland and the EU. So, yeah, I I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rian. I want to, before I um, throw it back to, to Victor for something, looking for, for some more remarks on how all this looks to investment companies, I want to just ask Patsa to follow up on Ria's points about materiality, um, because perhaps some of those watching might not be, might not have very detailed knowledge of the great materiality debate that I'm sure many, many of us have been gripped by in recent months. And it, it really is a very serious um, debate underway. And I think it's fair to say that there seems to be a particular position taken by authorities in the EU that seems to be somewhat different, perhaps, from the position that's taken by those who are developing the ISSB, um, those in the, among the US authorities. I wonder if, Patty, you think that's fair to say. Uh, and where exactly does do the European authorities stand in the great materiality debate? And perhaps also, um, for the benefit of, the, of some of those watching, you could explain exactly what we're, we're talking about here when we talk about single, double, and dynamic materiality. Uh, well, you know, so we, we uh, like any other jurisdiction, welcome the creation of ISSB uh, that will produce a baseline. And I think we were very insistent on that, uh, on the fact that the ISSB needs to work with the regional standard setters, such as FRAC or others, to make this all work. Um, I, I understand the, the, the idea that sometimes the Europeans are being questioned, so why do you want to go uh, higher? Why do you need to do that? I mean, we all 
we work towards our our Paris Paris commitments and Paris Paris goals. That we designed a strategy, or we as, 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 as bureaucrats, and then we go to the council and the parliament. We design uh, uh, laws and regulations that are supposed to get us there, and we are really convinced that this is the way forward. We are not imposing on anyone, and we are absolutely committed to interoperability of these standards. Um, I. I would bring you an example f from from one of the groupings which we which we trying to engage with with other jurisdictions. We had in, in G20 we had a discussion on, on on scope three emissions, which obviously we as Europeans really believe in disclosure of scope 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 three emissions. We are uh, um, cognizant that this is not an easy task. There's data issues, and we are also cognizant that there are different starting points in jurisdiction and different also you know technical capacity of these jurisdictions. Now, what do you want us to do? Should we, because it may be difficult for someone or someone doesn't believe in it, should we drop it? Or should we try to lead it, do it for us, and then as, the, as it becomes possible for the others, based on their capacity or based on availability data, is it, isn't it incumbent on the Europeans to help them to get there? I mean, there are, there are two, this is how I see it. So absolutely committed to baseline standard. Obviously, that will not probably include double materiality in which we believe. We will do it and then we we'll see how we take it forward with others. Also, on the issue on, on taxonomies, um, Taxonomy is a voluntary instrument. There are indeed 28 taxonomies. I think they will be evolving. This is why we were at the beginning of creation of the IPSF, where people can actually look at that. I would like to sell or point out something I think I spoke about at this forum last year. We have uh, we have done something called Common Ground Taxonomy Report with China, and I think this is the way how we could uh, either converge as a line, I think, is a too strong word, converge or render these um, uh, instruments interoperable. Thank you so much, Peter. That's, that's really useful. And so, Victor, how, how is this looking to investment companies, to your members, this question of whether reporting standards should require single materiality, so with a focus on risks um, or double materiality, which also includes accounting for the impacts that the company or the asset has on the environment and, and wider society. Do your members have a preference? I suppose double materiality would require more work for them potentially, but do many of them think that it's the right way to go? No, thanks, Simon. In, in, uh, as usual, with those questions, there is never an, an, an easy, easy, straightforward answer. I think, as I said from the beginning, and many of our members are operating globally, which means that they will have a significant presence in the EU. And I think if you look at the agenda, the EU sustainable finance agenda of the in the last couple of years, particularly the decision to, to adopt a taxonomy, which ultimately is a list of sustainable activities, or the SFDR regulation, which mandates reporting on, on the principal adverse impacts of your investment decisions, from taken from that lens, it makes total sense to pursue a double materiality approach. Actually, I think you would struggle to find the data to fully comply with those requirements if you didn't have a double materiality approach. Obviously, we are in a globalized world where jurisdictions have different perspectives and are going at different speeds. That, that's the reality we are in. And I think it's interesting what Petr said on this on this scope free, because that is an issue that pops up in many different jurisdictions. And I think it's it's you know different levels of sensitivity. Of course, there's a question of data precision. There's a question for our members operating globally in some jurisdictions where the question of liability when you disclose something in regulatory filings is also you know a, a, a issue we need to consider. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I think it's always good to remind us of what we're doing this for. Because if you look at the macroeconomic profile of the EU, the fact is a lot of the scope free emissions of the EU will be located elsewhere in other jurisdictions where the, you know a lot of the manufacturing base is located, for example. So we need to make sure that we have this global baseline and that all jurisdictions stay committed to that project so that we get gradually more transparency and more quality of data also from companies located in those jurisdictions where scope free emissions may be located. So I think that, that that's you know maybe a long answer for a simple question, but there's no there's no easy answers in this space, I think. I wouldn't say it's a simple question, but no, that's really helpful. Thank you. And Rhea, Victor talked there about scope three emissions. So of course, for those who aren't familiar, this refers to emissions that can be attributable to the use of a company's product and also from its supply chain. Um, and this is often seen as one of the most difficult areas of the data 
challenge. And we had a, an FT Moro Money conference in Singapore a few weeks ago when one of the panelists in a session that I was moderating talked about, you know, every company wants to provide more data, provide more transparency, but the problem is there is this shortage of data that really limits what we can do at the moment. And then another panelist jumped in and said, look, I'm sick of people using data as an excuse. Yes, we don't have unlimited data, but there is a lot of data and companies could provide more data, more transparency than they are doing. How does it look to you, Rio? Do you think there is a lot more potential to, to work with the data and the, the information that we have? Or are we really sort of running into hard limits here in terms of what can be provided? Thank you. Thank you very much for Simon. Data is very, very critical to uh, for the transition to net zero. And uh, so we are working together with other regulators as well. And uh, so I believe many people would agree that the NGFA scenario is a successful example of global co uh, cooperation. So the FSB also, the Financial Stability Board, is also working uh, together with the NGFS to uh, tackle with the, the data issues uh, by collecting a lot of uh, examples of the scenario analysis. So many uh, jurisdictions are collecting uh, useful data, including scope three, through their scenario analysis. So I think uh, we will uh, have the, the progress in this area. And also, I would like to mention that the JFSA emphasizes that a company must be judged not only on the basis of its current status, but also in terms of prospective uh, rate of improvement. In this sense, uh, judging whether a sustainability-related transition plan uh, taken by a company is credible uh, and science-based will be a fundamental backbone to ESG uh, investment decision-making. So we believe this uh, philosophy is increasingly understand, uh, understood and ac accepted by various stakeholders. Thank you. Thanks, Ria. Um, Petra, coming back to you, um, when I started this job last year um, and I was looking at what was happening in the EU and internationally, there was definitely a sense that the EU, as we've heard earlier, was really blazing a trail, setting the standard. But since then, there's been, um, I've heard complaints and uh, uneasiness about some areas. So, for example, there's been a lot of controversy around the green taxonomy, um, the inclusion of, of gas and nuclear with clear conditions attached in there. A lot of people have been unhappy with that about the, um, the order in which various regulations um, have come into force. So the SFDR in some respects coming into force before the CSRD, which means that investment companies are having to report before um, many of the companies that they invest in have similar requirements to provide that sort of information. So some people have the sense that um, it's been a, a challenging year for the EU sustainable finance regulation drive. Do you think it would be fair to, to characterise that? I mean, do, it, would it be fair to have concerns about the momentum um, in the space and also the, the effect to which political uh, disputes and debates may be getting in the way? Um, so, so yeah, thank you. So let me just do one thing. I think that on, on data, because I think this panel will all agree that data will be absolutely key and we will have to uh, be discussing it more and more. This is why we were very happy that at the UNGA meeting, um, something called Open Data Platform was created because uh, a comparable, um, uh, and comparable and quality data will be key, especially if we're going down the route of double materiality. Now, uh, to your... Um, to your uh, uh, mildly controversial question. <laughs> uh, um, I, I Look, it's clear that any regulation is, uh, is challenging and, and we are touching on such important issues here, which obviously indeed may have impact on costs of companies that it doesn't shock me that uh, there is a debate uh, um, and, and, and lots of uh, articles about it. I would say that with respect to the green taxonomy, you know, we have a, a fairly, this is the European Union is a democracy. This is a, a legislative process. We have proposed it. Uh, that there is an adoption on that through, through a certain system. And I think now we, 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 in the EU, gas and nuclear are considered uh, under strict conditions as, as, as help to transition. Um, um, 
I, I don't want to speculate on things like that. I think that uh, um, we have already reached a certain milestones and I, th I have not detected um, uh, from the political level that there would be any hints on saying that we no longer doing sustainable finance. I don't know where that is coming from. <laughs> Yeah, and no, I think there's a, there's a certain sense in which the debate has really heated up. And as you say, perhaps it's because certain things are, are starting to bite. Um, but Victor, being, being based, I think, still in Brussels, um, so you're, you're really at the geographical centre of, of that debate. How do you feel about the pace of progress in this area in the EU? No, I, I, like I, I think, you know, in previous panels mentioned that already, I think and it's no secret. Uh, I think we lessons need to be drawn about the sequencing of different measures. I think and I think probably everyone agrees that if we had to redo it again, we probably might have sequenced it slightly differently on some points. Uh, but I think the sequencing issue comes back to uh, what previous speakers raised about, uh, you know, the rollout of the different measures, SFDR, the, the suitability preference test for MIFID, which ultimately is important because that's how asset managers sell their financial products to investors and in, in, in the advisory process they provide there. And I think there we're, we're reaching a point which is a bit challenging. Uh, and let me explain a little bit more here. Uh, on the one hand, we've got regulatory expectations with a, a level of highly detailed and prescriptive disclosure requirements and very precise. I mean, they're, they're very precise. And on the other hand, we have this fundamental fact that we're operating both under the uncertainty about the quality of data. I think that will take a number of years to improve. But also, I think something we need to remind ourselves always is, you know, asset management is a global business. It operates globally, it invests globally. And the fact is, if you look at some of the EU requirements, you know, in I think latest statistics published by ESMA show it in in USIT funds domiciled in Europe, sold to retail investors, around 60 or more percentage of the AUMs there are invested outside Europe, potentially in companies where we may not have the same disclosure rules, the same quality of data. So that will remain a challenge, and I think that will be very, remaining a, an important challenge in the future. And I think. We need to be careful here about the element that we haven't mentioned on this panel yet, but what discussed this morning, which is greenwashing. When have you cases of greenwashing that are intentional? And when do you have cases where simply people accuse our members of greenwashing because the disclosures aren't yet perfect? And I think we need to be very careful here to distinguish that because this carries a reputational risk for our industry and it's you know it, it, it doesn't entirely seem fair in some cases that that's the case. And the second element which I'd like to bring here is that I think in the future we'll have to be very uh, mindful of the bigger picture. The bigger picture is that to solve climate change, we need to leverage money, but particularly for emerging markets. That is where we have a big funding gap in the future for the low carbon transition. Uh, but again, and our members tell us that all the time, is the quality of data there is more challenging. Uh, and particularly when you're thinking also about additional requirements in the EU that are being developed around due diligence standards for investors. Uh, the fact is, in due diligence terms, yes, you will have challenges operating in certain markets. And I think we have to make sure that those requirements ultimately don't end up active, acting as a deterrent for asset managers and investors to mobilize capital in those regions of the world where we will need it to ensure that transition. It's a really important point. It's something we've been looking at uh, in Moral Money this year, the, the, the risk that if you have ESG strategies that are very focused on having very high governance levels, very high levels of data disclosure, um, you could end up disproportionately steering capital away from poorer countries that have weaker institutions, that have weaker data systems. Um, and that's obviously not going to help us to reach the SDGs. Um, Rie, looking at um, the Asian region, Japan is a very prosperous country in a region with a lot of countries that are much less prosperous that really need investment. How do you think the Japanese, the sustainability standards in Japan can help to really support that flow of capital um, into those developing countries in the region and, and of course, beyond? 
Yeah, thank you so much. So we are working together with uh, other Asian countries as well. And uh, also, uh, so the Energy Affairs is working for the, the, the investment in uh, uh, other uh, the developing countries as well. And throughout Asia, the financing channel through banks is predominant. So many regulators, so in, in many Asian countries, uh, the bank's regulations are more advanced, I think. So also the Japan FSA uh, just published supervisory guidance on climate-related risk management and client engagement to encourage banks to actively support the transition of their clients, including the Asian countries. Uh, the support uh, includes not only financial support, but also consulting and uh, uh, solution delivery services. So guidance uh, provides possible approaches and case studies of client engagement, especially for the use of regional banks as a reference. So maybe we can share the, these practices with other countries. And uh, uh, we are actively working for the, the, the investment in uh, Asian countries. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, so, Peter, I think uh, we're, we're very nearly out of time. Um, but I did just want to, to round things off by just looking at where things go from here at the global level. We've been talking a lot about your views on Europe, but of course, you're also something of an expert on how this is looking globally. Um, what should we expect? What are the key things to watch? Um, what are the key risks that, that we hope will be avoided in this area? Well, <laughs> that's, a, that's a very, very tough question. I mean, uh, I, what I can say is that the way we're looking at that, that we can engage internationally in G20 based on the Sustainable Finance Roadmap, which for us is kind of the guiding light, then we're engaging in FSB. And, and there is a loop between the, what we do internationally and what, what our colleagues do domestically and proposing domestically. What, what I think, but that's really my personal view, is, because, is that... Um, Indeed, we all now creating legislation, so we're going to have to at some point really settle and see where, where the potential divergences are. And I would see the key risk if the data issue is not, uh, is not fixed. Uh, where where if, if, if we cannot put together comparable data which would be accessible to everyone, then I think that some of the um, 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 intended impact would not be uh, would not be achieved. I mean, certainly the EU is looking at that, and certainly um, we are now focused on the usability of our rules domestically and trying to, as you said earlier, lead that uh, internationally. Um, the EU is really mindful, by definition, of, of its impacts um um of on on other jurisdictions so i i don't think we could be accused of just just going going at it alone i think i don't think that EU has, has 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 ever done it by definition we are kind of multilateral because the eu is a grouping of countries thank you very much Petra. <laughs> Um, there is so much more to discuss, but I'm afraid we're out of time. Thank you again to all the panellists for your really interesting contributions. And back over to you, Judith. Thank you so much there. Sam Amundi and his panel speakers truly crunching that debate about convergence of global taxonomies or fragmentations, as it were. And I'm taking some really interesting insights away there, for example, also relating to, uh, yet again, the importance of reliable and comparable data, and then how greenwashing needs to be understood in certain parts of the world. And then we'll now want to turn it over to the perspective of some of the biggest corporations in the heavy industry to talk about the industry perspective on sustainable finance from the steel sector, one of the hard to abate sectors, as it is called, and one of those sectors that truly is key to reduce emissions so we can re reach our net zero goals. Uh, just to give you some perspective, two thirds of the global steel production still relies on coal, which means it produces more CO2 than any other heavy industry, some 8% of global emissions. But to decarbonize steel is very intense on, on time and on capital. Just to give you some perspective, according to the Green Steel for Europe Consortium, the steel sector net zero transition requires uh, investment in new technology to the tune of 50 to 60 billion euros. And on top of that, uh, we would need 
uh, between 80 and 120 billion euros per year just to cover capital and operating costs. And to find out more about this transition to net zero from the perspective of a hard to abate sector, I have the pleasure now to welcome in the studio Genuino Cristino, the Chief Financial Officer of ArcelorMittal, one of the biggest players in the industry, which happens to have a headquarter here in Luxembourg, we are where we are right now. Genuino Cristino started his career at ArcelorMittal uh, in Brazil in 2005. He came to Luxembourg in 2009 and before being appointed as Group CFO in February last year, he served as Group Head of Finance since 2016. So a warm welcome to you, Genuino. Great to have you at the Sustainable Finance Forum. Genuine, it's such a pleasure that we make use of you being based in Luxembourg indeed. So just let me put our audience into you know the picture what ArcelorMittal Metal means for the markets, for investors uh, who may have your shares. You ha you're truly an industry bellwether, as we would say, you know, in financial reporting, uh, with a presence in 60 countries, with primary steelmaking facilities in 16 countries, and you're actually listed in New York, Amsterdam, Paris, Luxembourg, and Spain. So the market is truly closely watching what you are doing and how you are meeting your, your net zero commitments. Um, I looked at the roadshow presentation uh, that was, I think, from the first half, first quarter, uh, for investors regarding your sustainable development features. And it was really um, laid out very transparently, very interesting for investors, um, quite prominently. Can you give us an idea how uh, ArcelorMittal's decarbonization and sustainable de development plans are unfolding, especially in light of that confluence of multiple crises that we're seeing? Sure. Thank you, Judith. And it's a pleasure to, to be here and talk a little bit about uh, Acelomittal and our decarbonization plans. Decarbonization is, is for us, Judith, uh, probably the biggest challenge uh, that uh, we face. And we're going to be facing this challenge over the next decades. So for us, it's, uh, it's really strategic that we can lead this uh, decarbonization journey, this steel industry decarbonization journey. We believe that we are very well positioned to do so. Um, we, uh, we have deep knowledge, experience with all steel making technologies. We are present, uh, we have presence uh, globally, uh, and I, I, I'm sure we have some of the best minds in the industry. As you said at the beginning in your introduction, it still is one of the hard to abate sectors. There are challenges, and I'm sure we will have the opportunity to touch on some of these challenges here today. Uh, but the good thing is that we believe that it still has an opportunity also to demonstrate its importance. It's uh, one of the most uh, useful materials in the world. I think we start from a good point uh, in terms of the footprint still has the lowest footprint uh, uh, compared to some comparable uh, materials. We are the most recyclable uh, material as well. Uh, and, and more importantly, when we look at what we have in front of us, uh, the transformation that we have in front of us, when you think about electric cars, you think about uh, uh, wind, solar, the renewable sector, uh, it still is going to play a very, very important, very important role. Uh, the good news is that uh, even though we are in a hard to abate sector, we believe that decarbonization of the industry can be achieved. And as a matter of fact, we announced last year our targets. So we announced uh, we want to reduce our emissions at group level by 25% in this decade to the end of 2030. And we have even more ambitious targets for, for Europe. Uh, we want to reduce our emissions by 35%. Uh, and we have the ambition to be net zero by 2050, um, which is, uh, of course, very well aligned with the uh, Paris, Paris Agreement. Now, uh, so what, what have we done so far, uh, Judith? I think I just wanted to spend a moment uh, talking about that. 
So the whole organization today is very much mobilized. Uh, so we have been working very, very uh, extensively and hard with the uh, member states in Europe. We have recently announced uh, three large projects in Spain, in France, and in Belgium. Total investments in excess of 4 billion euros. So I think there is good alignment between the company, between the member states. Um, and what these projects uh, they do is basically we will be transitioned from the very traditional blast furnaces into what we call the DRI and the electric arc furnaces. And when you do that, you basically remove the coal from uh, the energy source. And with that, you can then achieve the CO2, the CO2 reduction. Uh, that's not all. We have also announced uh, that we have plans to have our Sestao plant in Spain the first um, produce of la in large scale of uh, net zero uh, steel, which is an ambitious uh, target. That's actually in operation already. Not, yet. not yet. So we have announced mm -hmm. what needs to be done mm -hmm. for us uh, to, to get there. And this is not all. Uh, we are also very um, uh, pleased with the progress we are making outside of Europe, uh, and especially in NAFTA. So in NAFTA, we have announced a similar uh, project for our uh, Canadian operations. And uh, there we are actually more advanced because we have secured already uh, the funding and, 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 and the project is, is, is ongoing. And we have really um, the possibility by 2026, seven to completely eliminate coal from our uh, NAFTA operations, which is uh, a very good uh, achievement. Um, and then you touch on um, you touch on um, on the crisis, uh, Judith, and, and that's of course in everybody's mind. And uh, it is uh, clearly it creates uncertainty. But we are taking the view that uh, this is not something structural. We believe that given time, uh, Europe will come out of this crisis stronger, and we may actually see an acceleration of the development of renewable power, which is something uh, critical for uh, our industry journey as well. So we remain optimistic that we'll see good developments there. I find that rather encouraging, given the task that you have ahead of you. Can you just give us a bit of flavor how your plans have been impacted, particularly by those rising energy prices? and? in parts of the world, also in Europe, by the in uncertainty about energy supply? Yeah. The way we are responding is clear, clearly with the increase in energy uh, prices, gas prices, power prices. Uh, that creates, of course, anxiety. It creates uncertainty in the minds of our, our customers. Uh, we are seeing or experiencing what we believe is uh, this talking. So the demand uh, for, uh, for steel products in Europe, especially now in the second half, we expect to be weaker. And how we are responding to that at the moment is reducing production uh, to the levels that we believe is needed uh, for the, de local, to the demand that we have. So that's how we are responding at the moment. But again, uh, we believe that this should be something temporary. Mm -hmm. uh, so these facilities remain, of course, available should we see a change. And we are actually seeing prices coming down, uh, gas prices coming down. Uh, we are seeing energy prices also starting to come down, which is also good news, and hopefully we will see more of that coming. So again, that, um, that distinction between short-term headwinds, but keeping your eye on the ball regarding the big transformation. So how are your investors responding to the plans you've just described uh, yeah. in a sketch? Well, I think that's an interesting question, and, as, and, and, and you, you cannot imagine uh, the amount of time that we have been spending I talking. I imagine you get a lot of questions <laughs> in so that regard. Talking a lot, spend a lot of time talking to our stakeholders, yeah. and, uh, and I, I believe we have uh, a, a very good response. I think uh, they appreciate the size of the challenge that we have in front of us. Uh, they appreciate the transparency of our reports. We publish our very detailed climate report uh, last year. Uh, we are spending quite a lot of time also um, uh, trying to help uh, organizations, um, and I can mention a few, like the Mission uh, Possible Partnership, Climate 100 Plus, CDP, mm -hmm. And we use uh, these forums also to benchmark ourselves against peers. And, and I would say that we, we, have, we rank quite well 
uh, when we look at some of these uh, uh, rankings. Which are quite important for the financial community to then go to the regulator and say, this is what we're doing, this is how we're investing, and it aligns with, with, with the frameworks you've given us. Um, let's talk a little bit more about how you're financing the transition. You already illustrated your collaboration with, the, with governments, with the public sector. But that, that is only one part of the equation, I imagine. Yeah, of course. So I think just to give uh, everybody a, a perspective on the size of the investment. So we talked about our targets for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, to be able to deliver those targets, we have uh, announced uh, investments in the tune of $10 billion that we uh, believe we're going to need to execute by the end of 2030. Um, so, uh, we have out of the 10 billion we have already announced, as we discuss the projects in, in, in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, in, in NAFTA. So out of the 10 billion we have already announced uh, close to 6 billion out of, of, out of the 10, so good progress there. Uh, and I think one aspect that maybe not a lot of people will know, and, and you quoted some very big numbers for the decarbonization of the industry, is that actually two thirds of the investments needed they actually happen outside of the steel uh, walls, let's say. Uh, so because we're going to be consuming much more uh, power, so we're going to need uh, green energy. And, uh, and if you really want to achieve uh, net zero, we will also need the development of hydrogen. So, uh, but I would say uh, we are asking, uh, Judith, for these projects to be uh, for them to, to really uh, come true, we are asking for governments to support, to help us fund, fund these projects. And I also, also wanted to spend a moment to explain why funding from governments is, is important in this case. If you look at Europe uh, today, we are the only, uh, only region in the world really paying a high cost for uh, carbon emission. Nobody else is doing that. And we are competing with the whole world. Uh, we have imports taking market share in Europe uh, year after year, which is, of course, a concern. Uh, so today we don't have a level playing field. Uh, we, uh, it's not a fair competition. And second, when you transition from the blast furnaces to these new technologies, the, uh, the operating costs will be just much higher. So that's why having support from governments will be, uh, will be quite, quite, quite important. Uh, allow me to bring in another aspect um, that it ha has been raised by some of the very knowledgeable organizations in, in, in regards to financing, especially transition in heavy industries, which is um, transition bonds and sustainability linked bonds that has been proposed by the Climate Bonds Initiative as one way to go. And indeed, um, one of your competitors, Swedish steelmaker SSRB, has issued an LSB bond, sustainability linked bond earlier. Um, what do you make of such instruments? Are there um, a, po a potential for you, possibility for you? Yeah. Well, uh, I think uh, this is a trend that we are seeing more and more. Uh, more and more companies actually go in that direction. And, and, and for me, this is a very clear message also from, from our society that uh, this is important and needs to be accelerated and they want to be part of it. So that's why investors are keen to uh, participate in this in this market. What, what we have done so far, Judith, we uh, not long ago we have uh, refinanced our, our large credit facility, our revolver credit facility, which is uh, it's a 5.5 billion uh, facility, and we have converted that facility into a sustainability link facility. So that was our first step, and uh, and going forward, I believe that we're going to be uh, also looking to issue. Uh, uh, you know, green bonds as, 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 much, as much as we can. I think it makes a lot of sense for us, for an industry like ours. I think it's very important that we can attract uh, the funds from uh, investors uh, to support this, this transition. Let me just move uh, to that topic that was discussed in depth um, in the panel before and hear your perspective on that regulatory effort um, that we see 
in Europe and in many countries around the world. And you are truly uh, an, a company that operates globally to build a sustainable finance architecture to help channel that capital into the uh, transition. Um, how, what is your perspective on it? Yeah, well, I, I think it is a challenge. We see more and more of this uh, of new architectures coming up every day. Uh, so, but we do understand the importance of engaging and trying to help the different stakeholders to respond the questions that they need to respond. So, it's different stakeholders they will have different needs. Uh, so, looking at the problem from a different dimension, I, I think it's it's quite uh, quite important. And uh, recently we were engaged with the Center for Climate Aligned Finance and the uh, uh, Rocky Mountain Institute trying to help them to come up with the methodology that will um, be able to um, answer the question, okay, are the loans uh, also aligned with the Paris Agreement or not? So it's a completely different perspective, but we understand the importance of, of doing that. Of course. And... Looking at another um, very important aspect you already touched upon um, when you said earlier, globally it's not a fair level or a level playing field because we have different conditions and, and that is very much down to the EU carbon market, of course, which is up for reform. It's one of the cornerstones of the EU's Fit for 55 package that, that aims to make the Green Deal more effective. Uh, can you just uh, give us a bit of a flavor of what uh, your hopes and expectations are as far as the, ch the expected changes are concerned? Yeah. Well, first of all, it, it has been a very long process. It has. <laughs> uh, I think we are in the final uh, stage now. We are in what we, uh, I think what is called the trial uh, phase where uh, you have uh, the three parties trying to come to consensus. Mm -hmm. uh, we very much uh, welcome some of the changes that were introduced by the council and by the parliament to the original proposal from the, the Commission. I think uh, at the end of the day, we believe that the system can be effective. Uh, it can help uh, Europe to achieve its objectives. I think uh, it's just how we do it. Uh, and it's very important that we achieve a good balance. Uh, as we just discussed, we have already quite a lot of headwinds uh, in Europe. And if we have undue pressure uh, in terms of new targets, if it is too much, it, you, we may actually see undesired consequences. And that can be uh, the European industry actually shrinking. Um, and we, will, we may see investments actually moving from Europe to other parts of the world. And I don't believe that that's the objective. And uh, I think, again, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a good mechanism. Uh, and we, we were hopeful that other countries would follow that, uh, but needs to be done in a way that uh, we can do what we need to do uh, in, in the time frame that we have. Thank you so much for your insights, Genoino Cristino. It's been a pleasure to have you here in the studio with us at the Sustainable Finance Forum. And so to wrap up our first day at the Sustainable Finance Forum 2022, a few takeaways that stood out for me. Luxembourg's finance minister, Yuriko Bakas, said that Russia's aggression has not only underlined the EU's need for energy independency, but also the need uh, to shift away from those fossil fuels. And she said that the financial sector truly is the most powerful tool that we have to help channel those investments and mobilize private capital to reach net zero targets. Chris Peters from the EIB followed up with that rallying call that it's time for sustainable finance to push through and deliver, uh, with the EIB being as a shining light as the EU's climate bank and the largest multilateral development issuer of green, social and sustainable bonds, truly showing the path. Claude Marx, who's the head of the regulator of, um, the, for the banking industry in Luxembourg, the SSF, said uh, there will be a lot more coming in with uh, 
uh, sort of phasing in, uh, in terms of pieces for the sustainable finance regulatory architecture coming into force soon, for example, and that's very important for the, for the financial industry, the RTS, the regulatory technical standards in the uh, sustainable finance disclosure regulation, and then also for the non-financial businesses, the SCRD from the beginning of next year onwards. And he said there are three hot topics that per regulators will particularly keep an eye on, one being greenwashing in light of growing investor demand for sustainable finance products, ESG ratings, uh, referring to the need for reliable data sources and integrating climate risk into internal models and governance. And our panel on regulatory convergence or fragmentation um, had a look at the different ambitions in different parts of the world, for example, to that very interesting topic of materiality. And they agree definitely that comparable data is key and on the one on the one hand and on the other hand common understanding what for example constitutes greenwashing in what certain parts of the world compared to others and while one framework to rule them all if you will may be wishful thinking there is indeed a lot of goodwill between countries for example at g20 level to achieve what at least is called interoperability of frameworks and the work on that is very much ongoing because time is of the essence. And our panel on sustainability versus returns truly, I think, did a good job squaring that circle by looking at the academic uh, versus the financial practitioner perspective, for example, on that sometimes elusive greenium. Um, one of the key takeaways is that we may be realizing that we operate in silos in which experts in different parts of the industry are uh, working by themselves when they actually should be collaborating to truly get to those uh, solutions that we need to meet those unprecedented challenges in our society. So education, as was said, could play really a key role here. And that was agreed by the regulator side because learning, and I thought that was one of the best lines I heard today, learning gives confidence to take the next step and the next step. Kudos for Christopher Flensburg who said that. And Jennifer Wu from the Asset Management Industry from JP Morgan Asset Management really pointed out that there's one area that investors need to keep an eye on. Not only do we need to invest in bringing down the bringing down down those emissions, but also invest in climate adaptations as already communities right here, right now in Europe as well, are needing to protect themselves against um, the fallout of climate change. And she said that COP27 coming up in November in Egypt will be a reality check for markets to understand where countries stand in delivering against those net zero targets. So what are we going to do tomorrow? Tomorrow we will go, uh, dive deeper into those topics, the sustainable finance topics beyond uh, climate finance. Specifically, as for the finance minister said earlier today, we're looking at the rise of the S and the G in ESG and why those matter also for the E, as it were. We'll have a follow-up on a baseline study that was commissioned by Luxembourg for Finance two years ago in regards to human rights and financial services. And we'll look into the future of labeling in light of stricter scrutiny by regulators in regards to greenwashing and the potential of a pan-European eco-label that's in the pipeline. And we'll elaborate on an issue that was already much talked about today, reliable and actionable ESG data, why that is really key to make uh, sound decisions to channel investments into sustainable economic activities. And we'll discuss the importance of the EU carbon markets that Genoa and Cristina had just mentioned, how important they are for the transition to Paris aligned, um, to a Paris aligned economy. And then we'll wrap it up with a look ahead for sustainable finance by one of its best known experts. So do join us tomorrow again. We'll be right here for you from 10 a.m. onwards, Central European time in our studio in the European Broadcasting Center. Please look out, uh, look into your inbox because you'll receive a new stream, a new link for the stream tomorrow. So I hope to see you again. Thanks for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day and I shall see you tomorrow.